Brooklyn Aboyim, thank you for coming. Hopefully, uh, you followed the uh, story of the two porters, the story of Boris and uh, Beryl and their tests to uh, be able to acquire great wealth. Again, Boris was not successful. Beryl was successful. And uh, again, the story of Beryl, Boris being able to watch Beryl as he went through his test and succeed where he failed. Um, if you haven't, hopefully you have, but if you haven't, please read them. Hopefully you'll find them interesting. Story that I wrote. What I'd like to do tonight is the epilogue, tie the whole thing together. And then I'd like to go through an overview and see the depth of the story and what under, underneath, underlying what the story is about and why we as religious Jews and people in general read the stories because there's so much more that stories tell us other than the surface of what we see. So the epilogue begins that some years had passed and Beryl, though he was very wealthy, was not completely happy. True, he had wealth, but he missed that which he truly wanted, the ability to sit and learn Torah and also to spend more time with his children and now grandchildren. He had tried to form partnerships with different people, but somehow there was always something missing. And in the end, he was forced to run his businesses by himself, which left him with little time to follow his dream. Boris, on the other hand, had become a new person, one who valued time and a true commitment to detail and direction, so much so that one never saw him without his pocket watch or his compass. He was driven and successful. He had many porters that were working for him, and he was loved and admired by all of them, though he was a tough and demanding and demanded perfection. Beryl would use Boris's services often when he would come to his town, loading and unloading merchandise from railway cars and delivering them to his customers. You know, Beryl came to admire Boris's work ethic and his attention to detail. He too was aware of the pocket watch and compass that Boris kept with him every day. They were, so to speak, part of his uniform. The more Beryl studied Boris, the more he was certain that he had finally found the man that he was looking for to be his partner. The person who could run his business affairs and so that he could now enjoy those things that were so dear to him. So one day after Boris had successfully finished delivering all the merchandise that he had been commissioned to deliver, Beryl paid him his fee, including a generous tip, and asked him if he had time to speak. And so the two men sat down and Beryl told Boris how impressed he was with how he handled his business as employees. Beryl then offered him a full partnership in all his business enterprises. Boris was thrilled and he accepted his proposal and the two developed a long and prosperous relationship. So, you know, one day a few years later, Boris came to visit Beryl at his home where he was enjoying his many grandchildren. And they stepped out on the patio to share L'chaim. And Beryl said to Boris, what is it with this pocket watch and compass that you still carry with you all the time? Boris smiled and said to Beryl, that's it's a long story. And then Boris said to Beryl, I've always wondered, how did you manage to acquire your fabulous wealth? With a twinkle in his eye, Beryl said, has something to do with a desert, a mountain, and a forest. That ends the story. But the story can be read simply as two different people fulfilling their destinies. If we look deeper, though, we can find many symbolic ideas that could help us all on our journey in this world. The basic idea is that God tests us to our weakest point. It is his wish that we all grow, no matter what level we are on. Boris was a complainer. He was lazy, with little direction or proper motivation. He wanted to be wealthy, but without exhibiting the proper work ethic. He felt that God had shortchanged him. Beryl, on the other hand, was totally content with his life, but was not concerned enough about those around him. He needed to be pushed to leave his comfort zone and achieve more than he had. 
God gave them both the opportunity to do so. Boris needed no convincing, though initially he failed. Beryl succeeded, though initially he had little motivation. And in the end, both reached their potential and found purpose, success, and true contentment. The tests were meant to connect to spirituality, even though the reward would be physical. In all the tests, the direction they were instructed to follow was always due south. We see with Avraham that when he traveled, he traveled toward the south. The south alludes to the menorah, which symbolizes spirituality. It was on the south side of the holies in the temple. The inn connects with this world and the innkeeper, Satan, who offers us all types of pleasures and distractions. Their purpose is to distract us from our true mission in this world. Expensive accommodations, fancy clothes, good food, fine wine. Even other people who seem to be well-wishers who distract us from reaching our goal and objectives. Boris partook of all these pleasures and they contributed to his failure. Beryl preferred bread and fish to fine dining. Bread, the staple of life symbolizing simplicity. The Rambam says the most diseases are caused by overeating and overindulgence. You know, fish symbolize our struggle in life. The two signs that testify that a fish is kosher are scales and fins. The scales act as armor, protecting us from barbs and blows that the secular world throws at a person trying to be righteous. The fins gives us the ability and strength to go against one's nature and peers. If a fish cannot swim against the current, it dies, and so to us. If we cannot go against the currents of society and our evil nature, we die. Spiritually, Beryl went against the current. He rejected them and found true and lasting success. The curative baths that benefited both of them can be compared to a mikvah, a ritual bath. Going to a mikvah is not a commandment, and yet the spiritual benefits that it can produce are immeasurable. It's something like taking vet vitamins. You may not see direct results, but they have been proven over time to be a great benefit to people. Torah is compared to water. And just like water, though it may not taste as sweet as sugary drinks, its health benefits are substantial. So too Torah. When you immerse yourself in it, you are making yourself a much healthier spiritual person. As the Talmud says, if you walk into a perfume shop and buy nothing, you still walk out smelling better. The manual can be compared to the Torah, an instructional manual given to us by a benevolent father who wants us to, tra to traverse this minefield that we call life and succeed. But we have to study it in order for it to be of any, any benefit. Owning it isn't enough. We need to internalize its message in order for us to pass our test. The first two tests were connected with clothing. The clothing for the desert was preferable, but not really mandatory. One could have succeeded with or without the special clothing. It just made the task easier. The second test on the mountain, the clothing was critical to one's ability to be able to weather the elements. Without the proper clothing, success was improbable, if not impossible. However, the third test in the forest, there's no mention of any special clothing at all. It had no relevance to one's success or failure of the test. And so, too, in religious lifestyle, Jews' lifestyle. Much like the first test, there is a dress code that should be preferable. Clean, dignified, proper clothing that demonstrate that one is religious. And then, like the second test, there are religious clothing that are essential, such as the talit, tefillin, tzitzit, and the yarmulke, clothing that are required by Torah or rabbinic law. And finally, much like the third test, there are modern secular clothing that a religious Jew can wear that are quite proper, but do not make the statement that he is religious. The first style may be like a fence to help one maintain his religious lifestyle. The second style, an essential component connected to the observance of being an Orthodox Jew. And the third, a connection to the blessings that were given to Yaakov, our father, 
material blessings that he received from his father Yitzchak that were intended for his brother Esau. He dressed in Esau's clothing to fool his father. So these were blessings given to a religious Jew dressed as an Esau. The first test was in the desert, and just like the Jewish nation when they left Egypt. They too had many failures until they learned to follow the word of Hashem. In fact, there is nothing written in the Torah about what transpired between the beginning of the second and 40th year in the desert. They studied the manual, the Torah, and they were able to pass their test without any difficulties. However, even at the end of 40 years, even after 40 years of being totally immersed in spirituality, they lost their focus at Shittim, and many men died. As the saying goes, it's not over until it's over. Life is a marathon, not a sprint. Satan knows it very well. He never gives up, and we need to learn it. The next test was the mountain, which alluded to the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. This was not a place where the Jewish nation was formally given their manual. Pardon me, this, this was the place where the Jewish nation was formally given their manual, the Torah, to study. Their test was not to climb the mountain at that time, but just the opposite, not to touch or come near it. In our service of Hashem, we must learn to do as He commands, not to follow what we perceive to be the truth, and to stay focused at all times. All the tests were connected to a watch, time. In all the tests, they had the limited amount of time to complete the test. The third test, even more so, since each section opened up exactly on the hour. In order for us to be successful in our test in this world, we must be aware of time. It is a precious gift and finite. We have only so much time and we have so much to accomplish. Also, religiously, time is very important. In fact, the first mitzvah that we were given to the, as a nation of Israel was the sanctification of the new moon. Things such as prayer, Shabbos, holidays, circumcision, just to name a few, are connected with it. The compass was again critical in all tests. The direction was always south. We see in the Torah that Abraham, our father, always traveled toward the south, alluding to spirituality. The direction that we follow is crucial in our ability to succeed in our mission in life. Whenever Boris or Beryl drifted off course and were not traveling south, the test became much more difficult. Beryl realized this and kept checking his compass. And still, he lost focus and found himself off course. If we don't at least try to focus, we find ourselves drifting further and further from God and his ways. In the forest, they both quickly realized that they were walking in a maze that was constantly changing. Without the compass, they were doomed to failure. Their eyes deceived them again and again. The only way that we can navigate through this minefield that we call life is by checking our compass, the Torah. The truth is, like the lane, pardon me, the Torah is like the lanes on a highway of life, directing us towards our proper destination with an array of directional signs and traffic lights, helping us to find law, order, and happiness. It prevents us from speeding through life recklessly, causing pain and injury, both spiritually and physically, to ourselves and those around us. Torah is truth. It is a map that does not change. The third and final test was at the forest, an allusion to the Garden of Eden. And the three things that were needed to pass this test were the watch, the compass, and the flashlight. The flashlight, the Torah, is light. And the only way we can see the direction that we need to follow is by the light of Torah. Otherwise, we are walking in darkness. The tree was the tree of knowledge. And as we drift further and further from the path of Torah and mitzvahs, the desire to eat from the tree and to use its knowledge to rebel against God and his commandments increases. The end result is that we lose our chance to receive true reward that God offers us. Not at the end, this world, but in the world of truth, the world to come. In life, we must learn to follow the direction that God has chosen for us. 
we must constantly check our spiritual compass, even though at times it may seem to go against our subjective reasoning. We cannot always trust our physical eye that tells us that we are moving away from the glass door with all of its riches, because many times all we really see is a mirage. The only reality is God and his instruction manual. The angel warned them not to look to the right, the left, or backwards. In life, we need to focus on what is in front of us. Those events of the past are there to teach us, but we don't have to bring them back and relive our failures and disappointments again and again. Looking backwards only slows you down and can cause you to stumble and even fall. The right and the left also allude to other religions, such as Christianity and Islam. We as Jews only need to focus on Hashem, who is always in front of us, like the clouds of glory in the desert, lighting the darkness and showing us the proper path. The rite also alludes to the golden table that held the showbreads in the holy of, hol holies of the temple, which symbolized material success. The left alludes to the menorah that was placed on the left side of the holies, which symbolized spiritual success. We should not focus on either one exclusively. We should focus our attention on the ark, which was between the two, combining both the material and spiritual aspects of life through the attribute of humility, what we call Torah im derech eretz, the proper blend of material together with the spiritual. Boris could not see by himself. It is difficult to see yourself objectively. It was only when he was able to view Beryl and his tests that he was able to see his own deficiencies. Only then was he able to grow and change. He became the person that he needed to be. He stopped complaining about God. And he came to the realization that he had to change the one thing in life that he had the ability to change himself. Then all the pieces came together. Meeting up with Beryl was just a bonus. He was already successful because of all of his spiritual awakening. He no longer blamed God for his failures. He put his shoulder to the task and became successful. Beryl, even though he was working and totally involved with his love of Torah, was in his own way selfish. He didn't concern himself enough with the needs of his family or the poor around him. God forced him to leave his comfort zone, to go past himself and become a total giver. By becoming a true servant of God and helping those around him, he was able to acquire the true measure that God offers to each, pardon me, the true treasure that God offers to each one of us. And in the end, they both came full circle to fulfill their own unique talents. As partners, they were able to bring out the best in each other to fulfill their own individual missions. Together, they were able to form one perfect human being. May God help us to find our own unique treasures as we strive to unite the Boris and the Beryl within each and every one of us. Again, thank you very much for coming, and uh, have a great Shabbos. I hope you enjoyed the series.